helpful. So um, what are the areas you, you mentioned already? We have uh, the convergent technologies. Where do you see in, in what fields or with what other technologies, where can blockchain come in to really boost the other technology and vice versa? Well, let's, let's just um, stick with humanitarian and I'm happy to go with healthcare and then maybe money and supply chains, you know, it just depends. Yeah. Oh. I think, you know, with, with humanitarian, what you're seeing, so we've talked about the identity and, and enabling people to be able to get access to rations and other services in camps. But you're also seeing, a, you know, a lot of combinations of technology with GIS and drones and, and, you know, sort of secure data sharing to be able to track what's going on. Because often in humanitarian settings where people are fleeing and there might be armed conflict, they can't send people in to be able to see what's happening to the population. So there's a, there's a lot of work going on there. Um, it's increasingly common in camps to have 3D printers, um, you know, producing things that would take a lot longer for a supply chain to deliver. Um, a lot of humanitarian organisations, because 80% of humanitarian is logistics, are using uh, blockchain in their supply chains to try and make their supply chain stronger and more efficient. And then the other big one, of course, is in payments, because mm -hmm. a lot of humanitarian uh, relief is about providing direct payments to refugees, for example. And historically, that would be provided via a bank. Um, so you'd have all of the costs and the time associated with the bank and the issues about people without identities getting a bank account. And so being able to provide peer-to-peer -peer funding mm. um, to refugees is really powerful. So there's just a whole set um, of areas where technology is really enabling. And that's um, also the other one that I wanted to call out because I think this is going to be increasingly important and powerful is the use of voice technology. Hmm. Because um, a lot of people who are displaced are maybe illiterate. And so they might be able to be given a mobile phone, but they can't understand the instructions and they can't necessarily recognize numbers and words. And so there's a lot of work going on, on at the moment about providing very low cost devices. And when I say low cost, maybe $10. And people, uh, illiterate people can receive information training they can do voice activated searches they can be told how to set up a wallet for example so that they could receive um, government funding into their phones how to sell their produce in different places so there's quite a lot of evidence emerging about how powerful voice is going to be and you're talking i mean india alone has 200 million illiterate people so you're talking big numbers of people that can now be reached with voice technology. And um, if you have a look at Google, the, the new languages that they're working on now are all in developing countries because they understand that that's an important and untapped market. So voice is really important as well. I think it's interesting you made that point because um, in, a, in our industry, when we're talking about clinical genomics, genetic counseling, and areas like that, which we take for granted. We understand what a variant is, what a mutation is, what a SNP is, um, what SARS-2 is, what COVID-19 is, and all these kinds of things. But some of those phrases and concepts and understandings, um, if we're looking at uh, First Nations uh, people in, in Canada, uh, Australian uh, groups there, there's all over the planet we have these, um, the, these groups that, that in their language, they don't have the the words for want of a better word. And so I, I always thought that we have that issue in 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 general genetics and, and, and medical understanding, trying to get those concepts across. And there's usually an elder or a um, a tribal leader that we are kind of working with in some in some instances, some some witch doctors uh, that you're kind of working with. But um, uh, but there's a whole group of people that that need that understanding and and. And so we have that, we have that kind of issue already. And I, and I always thought we could probably use blockchain in that respect too, so we can actually bring those people to, together around the world. And within genetic counseling, there's a there's a global shortage of those people with those skill sets to to showcase that understanding. And uh, that's where I guess we get this idea of, of grouping together individuals that can 
that can share their knowledge in a trusted environment. And, um, and I think that's why voice and language is incredibly mm. important. But, but you know, you do raise a, a really interesting point because this is one that, you know, I've done some thinking and, and writing and speaking about, and that is what is informed consent <laughs> when you're dealing with, you know, illiterate people who don't have the concepts. And as people are getting terribly interested in the human genome and, you know, mm. people's genomic material and, and, and uh, you know, going around in emerging markets, paying people to get access to that, you know, what understanding do they have of what that access means and how it can be used and how it provides information about you and your family and all of those sorts of things. So, you know, I just think there's, uh, particularly in healthcare, but generally, there's some really critical ethical issues that need to be examined in relation to um, digital everything. Yeah. And, 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 you know, blockchain can, uh, can record things, but if it's not done properly in the first place, it's only going to record, you know, an inaccurate thing. And we That's have to right. think about how you apply.